Corey is the CEO of Sensible that was founded nine years ago. And Corey has raised seed, Series A, and Series B funding. Uh, Sensible is a tech company, specifically a platform around data and AI for banks and financial institutions. Thus, the bar for rigor and sophistication around finance and accounting is even that more critical given his client base. He's raised funds from Radical Ventures, Information Venture Partners, First Ascent Ventures, Mistral, Impression Ventures, and Operative Capital. Um, but the goal here is to just talk through uh, Corey's experience with finance and accounting, with working with Concero, and really how a well-heeled finance and accounting function can be a major value enabler, enabler for companies versus a detractor, which is something that Concero sees quite a bit. Well, Corey, let me pass it over to you and love to hear a bit about your background, about the company, and then we can take it from there with some questions. Sure. Uh, thanks so much, Parley, and I appreciate everybody uh, having me here today. Um, happy to talk about about our journey um, and, and certainly how uh, Concero has been such a great partner uh, and really the finance and service function has been so critical to us, not just getting started, but uh, throughout our growth story. Um, so the company uh, was founded uh, almost nine years ago out of Toronto, Canada, and the vision, the real thesis around the business was that financial institutions have this critical visibility gap in terms of um, seeing their customer spend. And, and customers have a visibility gap in actually seeing what they're actually buying um, in the context of their financial transactions. Um, although financial institutions provide them information about where they buy and how much they spent. So Sensible really sees itself as this bridge between banking, your banking transactions, and your buying data. Uh, we have a solution that allows customers of financial institutions to capture you know, invoices and receipts for business financial management and personal financial management. And sure. the use cases around our, our data include everything from uh, providing uh, those uh, those companies and customers better visibility and, uh, and a, a free expense management tool that's that's provided as value by the customer or the bank, our bank, uh, the customer, and, and also sure. for financial institutions to get greater visibility into their customers' buying patterns. Wow, excellent. So you've been in business for about nine years. Is that right, Corey? Yes, yes. Coming up on nine and years. And you're, a, you're an attorney by trade by my research. Now, now what, you left those, uh, you left those, that experience behind you and got into the, the, the known world of selling into banks and financial institutions, which is not for the faint of heart. What took you down that path? Yeah, I, uh, you know, I, I, I dabbled in a lot of different practice areas, uh, intellectual property, um, uh, in particular, but also some corporate, even even some personal in injury and immigration law, sure. and uh, had always been very entrepreneurial. Um, had always kind of been fascinated by the intersection of digital and retail, which back right. you know nine ten years ago was was very much in its early stage. Like there was no word fintech that was popularized yet right. um, when we were right. starting Sensible. And so, um, yeah, I was just, you know, energized to build something that I think could not just have value for an enterprise like a financial institution, but also for an everyday customer that interfaces with their money and, and wants to get more visibility in terms of where it's going. So, yeah, I was just motivated to do something that I felt passionate about. Right. And here we are Exciting. nine years later. That's great. Well, look, you know, going back to the early days as an entrepreneur and you were looking to go out and raise, you know, your early capital um, and growing the business, what were some of the core considerations that led you to choose a third party like Concero to, you know, as a financial partner to scale? <clears throat> yeah, so around the time we uh, we started to look for outsourced help uh, in, in building out the finance, uh, finance function it was before we raised our Series A and as, as we prepared um, uh, to go out and raise a Series A. Around that time, we had already uh, partnered with, I believe, two or three financial institutions, big money center banks in right. in Canada and the UK, and we had just about um, uh, nabbed a partnership with one of the major providers of financial technology to banks globally, and things were starting to get a little bit more sophisticated in terms of the rigor they were putting us through uh, from yes. a compliance uh, perspective. Uh, they wanted to see, you know, not just things like audited financial statements, which VCs want to see. But they wanted to have, uh, they wanted us to have, you know, more complicated insurance. We just, we needed to have a, a, a finance-oriented uh, leader. Um, but at that stage of business, we really couldn't afford to spend two hundred fifty, three hundred thousand dollars on a seasoned CFO. Not to mention all the various uh, individuals that would be required in APAR, controller, etc. 
And so, you know, we were very fortunate that we had someone in our network uh, that could provide that service to us and could really act as a partner to the business, not just in helping um, make our organization enterprise ready and partnering sure. and scaling the financial institutions, but also could allow us to, to meet the, the increased rigor of a due diligence process from institutional investors. Wow, that's exciting. So, so if you think about it, there are the more strategic aspects of finance and accounting, which obviously you had some help there. And then there's the kind of the more mundane and the technical, the kind of the AR, the AP, the closing of the books. Can you talk about kind of those two aspects and how, you know, how that really helped you as a CEO as you were growing the business? And obviously, so that was predating your your first fundraise. Is that right? Kind of you, you, you knew that that rigor was expected just given given the the end clients that you were working with. Is that right? So we had, we had raised some seed capital, which we really needed to okay. get the business off the ground in, in building out, you know, the, the product and and ultimately making the the, the product enterprise ready. I think we're, uh, and I was doing everything. I was doing payroll, I was doing accounting, and I am not an accountant by trade. I right. I, uh, I should not be trusted with uh, managing benefits in HR. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and, and so, you know, I certainly needed to have someone that would act as a partner uh, we did have some outsourced bookkeeping, even from a ver the very early days when they were taking that off my hands. But it was, right. you know, it were, it were from, you know, uh, smaller folks that weren't as close to the business, didn't understand uh, SaaS, uh, certainly enterprise SaaS. And so what we were looking for was someone who could understand our business a whole lot better, be value add in that regard, but also proactively advise us, not just as we were going through fundraises, but could advise us on how we should think of building a model that was fit for our type of business and that's where i think the value of finance as a service really came in not just to you know do the books and you know sure. prepare financial statements and whatnot but to uh, to be an advisor to me and the manager team and so obviously it sounds like on the strategic front you know that's very clear kind of going out to fundraising you know and the the budgeting the forecasting all that but on, and on the model but then on the more mundane it sounds like from a from a purely um, time standpoint, it was it enabled you to get back in the front lines on product and marketing and just growing the business and, uh, you know, commercially versus, you know, doing the payroll, as you mentioned, is that right? So there's a real time effect, uh, you know, for, for your purposes, is that right? Yeah, at a certain point, you know, you don't, you probably don't want me, uh, uh, you know, uh, doing payroll and, uh, and managing our books. You want me in front of customers, you want me sitting in product meetings. Um, yes. having casting what the future of the roadmap is and yeah absolutely that's uh that that mundane work is, is a part of it sure yeah that's 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 a very typical scenario we face when we come into work with new clients it's you know the the investors say look we've got a great founder or a great business but we've got to get them out of the weeds we can't have them doing payroll and doing AP and AR, we've got to let them flex up. We've just invested 10 million, 15, 20 million dollars in their business. That's not that's not the value we're looking for them to provide. That's that's really helpful. Um, so you've raised several rounds. Um, any words of wisdom, particularly around finance and accounting and prepping for diligence that you learned from you know your first round versus your second round and third round as you as you look back, any advice for you know, a lot of the folks in the line are, are CEOs, CFOs in a similar situation yourself, as well as investors. So any advice having gone through several rounds at this point? Well, I mean, I think that, you know, just our culture, um, we have a culture that we call culture of pie. So passion, integrity, excellence, and that I integrity value means a lot to us, not just in terms of how we, um, how we conduct our business internally and how we work with our peers, um, and also, of course, how we safeguard uh, commercial confidential information and really the data that we collect, the first party data we collect as part of our product. Um, but just in the way we operate the business and interact with our partners and investors. And so we've always been very, very transparent. We've tried to, we, didn't, we don't hide anything in deep diligence in a data room. Um, our materials were very thoughtfully prepared from series C to all the way up through series B. Um, yes. to give a full picture of the business. And I think in partnership with uh, Jason uh, from Concero, we were able to tell a story that uh, didn't feel disjointed from what would have been discoverable in, in diligence. It was just, we wanted to prepare comprehensive uh, packages up front so that anyone uh, wanting to get a read on the business uh, could do so without having to dig too deeply for the answers. Sure. Storytelling through Done. numbers. 
that's that's great. So really giving confidence and conviction to you as you went out to the market to raise capital that and, and to your potential investors that the story you're presenting all made sense and the numbers behind it. You know, one thing we talk about is is always kind of one single source of truth and that that ultimately investors and the CEO and CEOs, uh, sorry, CEOs and CFOs, to what extent we're working with them can really trust the data. So whether that's strategic investment in product or marketing or M&A, that you can really trust the data coming out of the business. That Does that sound like something that you felt was we were giving you as you moved into those uh, fundraises? I mean, yeah, absolutely. I mean, it also, you know, we, we, we wanted to uh, be thoughtful in terms of the plan that we put out. And, um, and so to me, it's, it's part of any plan, whether we're fundraising or not, is sure. when we go to get a budget approved on an annual basis, it has to make sense and it has to pass a smell test. So, um, you know, having not just the, the, the guidance and the, uh, and the strategic uh, counsel from a, from a partner, sure. Uh, like Concero, but also just the uh, the willingness to smell test that against all the other companies that might be in the network that Concero is working with is sure. supremely helpful. What is industry? What is market? What's not? Uh, and where sure. trends are, are, you know. So yeah, I think you said it best. I think that's I think that's well said. I think something we really strive to do is take kind of best practices across the 250 clients we work with and and share best practices for efficiency and. Uh, budgeting and, and board decks, et cetera, with, with, with our clients. So that, that's really great. So just to pivot to kind of day-to-day. So I'll say that in many instances when we're talking to potential new clients, uh, and I'd say this was pre-COVID predominantly, now since COVID, people are used to this idea that you're your head of FP&A or your controller is not sitting at arm's length because of what the world we're living in. But, you know, can you talk a bit about the operating mar- model day-to-day, kind of how you interface with Concero from a, you know, day-to-day, week-to-week, how that has worked out. Our goal is always to be a real direct appendage to our clients' teams. And so we'd love to hear your thoughts as to how that working relationship has gone uh, for you over the years. Yeah, I think very, very close, both mm-hmm. personal and professional, I think. You know, like any team member, uh, you become, uh, they become a part of your family. Um, and so, uh, you know, weekly one-on-ones, um, but also, a weekly finance cadence, um, and then and of course we have our our executive leadership team meetings on Friday, uh, where um, where obviously the CFO plays a big part in keeping everybody honest and up to date with the financial uh, health is of the business. And then on a monthly basis, we have functional budget um, reviews, and we you know adjust our you know Jason sits in in our our sales meetings uh, every other week just to make sure that. We're tracking and, and, and what, we're tra- what we're forecasting is being accurately reflected and updated in any materials. So it, it's just a part of your team. Uh, sure. And certainly in a, in a virtual, call it, you know, a distributed work environment, you don't really, you know, there's not anyone sitting in front of you or beside you anymore. So uh, my VP of product or VP of engineering uh, have about the same closest to me as um, a CFO. That's, that's really helpful. That's, that's obviously our goal. Um, you know, by the same token, we're not looking to be all things to all people. And, and we pride ourselves on, in certain situations, not working with firms that we don't think we can be a real force multiplier. And so our sweet spot, as you may remember, is, you know, companies anywhere from 5 million to 200 million in revenue as a starting point. As you think about the, the thought of outsourcing finance and accounting for any company, let's say CEOs and CFOs on the line here, what should they be considering? And like I said, there's some situations where we may not be a fit depending on some of the you know, real uniqueness of, of the business, but any advice there for companies of things they should think about that are important to them uh, as they're considering the outsource function? Um, I mean, I, I think it, you know, the best advice I could give is based on our own experience. For, for us, um, certainly when, we, when you have institutional money in the company, they want there to be some oversight. Uh, they don't want the CFO or the CEO playing CFO. Uh, I think having, we at one point had a, uh, an internal controller that was partnering with Concero so that there was some closest to the business, but also we had the executive and uh, strategic oversight uh, as well sure. as APAR support to make sure we had a little bit of the best of both worlds. So eventually we just transitioned all the way over to Concero because they had already so much knowledge of the business and it just became more effective, more efficient for them to take that on. Um, 
for anyone in you know seed series a stage wanting to have the, the sophistication of an internal finance function but who doesn't want to allocate the amount of cost that it would require to build that um, I absolutely believe that this is a, a viable and, and strong solution and if you are the type of organization that uh, whose business lines up well with the experience of a Concero, uh, there's a lot of value to be had there. Um, in Jason's case, he was the CFO of business analytics for IBM. And that's someone who could relate very closely to our business and play an active role in developing our company's strategy, uh, certainly our operational strategy. Sure. And uh, having that, that kind of uh, uh, support was, was really important for us as we grew the business. So. I think it all depends on the type of business you're in. Certainly, like you, you mentioned, um, uh, Bartley, the stage of business that someone's yes. in and whether they sure. have venture funding, right? Yeah, well, that's great to hear. I mean, I love hearing you say that, you know, working with Concero has been like family, you know, and, and that's really, you know, like I said, we try to be an appendage of the existing finance and accounting team. And really, you know, someone like Jason, who has the experience of a, at a Fortune 500 company, and that was kind of the genesis of Concero originally. Can we provide Fortune 100, Fortune 500 quality finance and accounting rigor, sophistication to to smaller companies. But we had a few questions come in from from the group. Um, so you know, somebody said they're particularly interested in hearing about how to prepare for due diligence. You know, you're you're just kind of suiting up, ready to go out and, and do due diligence. Any any advice there uh, for for companies as you look back? I think the best job that we ever did in preparing for diligence well in both our series a and series b um you know b was obviously heavier than a and it, it always ratchets up in terms of wanting to really get to the nitty gritty uh, gritty of the business um what i tried to do was and it was very helpful for me in telling the story and i think that any founder or business that's preparing for diligence in a fundraising round it's just a great exercise to put yourself out of the operating chair for a bit and, and, and allowing you to, to really get a handle on what your business is, how the market perceives your business, et cetera. And so what I did was I set off to build really comprehensive um, materials talking about our corporate story, then our product and technology story, and then our financial story in three separate packages. Uh, right. I remember the corporate story was ultimately the most tight. It was almost like an executive summary. And it challenged me to be able to tell the story of the business in really 10 to 15 slides. The product and technology story, we went from the problem statement, you know, customer personas, all the way through to um, uh, how the product solves the problem and, and why it's successful and proof points that it's successful. And the same was true in, our, in the engineering parts of that deck, really right. getting into sure. how it's built, et cetera. And then the financial presentation, you know, it has everything that you that you would probably uh, expect any investor to want to evaluate from, you know, your business model to your uh, your balance sheet, your P&L, um, understand at a functional level how, um, uh, how 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 the businesses are how the business is operating, sure. uh, really where is marketing allocation, where is marketing spend being allocated, and head right. and program spend, and how does that funnel ultimately translate. Uh, to revenue, like it really, we, we picked apart our business and we thought that having these these packages to provide to people up front was really helpful in orienting them around the business so that when it got into a data room with all the supporting information, whether it was our master services agreements, our, uh, our trademarks, our, uh, some of our, uh, um, uh, you know, our, our, all the standard HR uh, right. contracts and whatnot, um, it was uh, insurance. Uh, certificates of yes. insurance it was all just there was supporting documentation they weren't discovering new things about our business in the data room sure yeah that's great real real tight ship we had another question which was what was the biggest mistake a startup can make when preparing to raise funds whether it's around timing or some of the narratives but any <clears throat> any words of wisdom there raising money before they the, i think the you know I, there's a lot of hype these days around raising money and raising capital and i think uh it's the way it's covered it sounds like the end in, in into of itself um it's not it is a it is a path um and it is certainly a uh, a way of accelerating growth but i think a common mistake is for founders to get wrapped up in the raising money of it all and forgetting that they're trying to solve a problem achieve 
uh, product market fit and use capital to scale. And yes. I think a lot of founders raise money too soon. They get too hung up on valuation. It's kind of like comparing sizes, so to speak. And <laughs> instead, you know, and, and then and then I think there's there's so many stories of founders looking back and saying, I wish I didn't raise this much money or I wish I didn't raise money at this time because it really puts a, um, a ticking time bomb on your business. When you haven't raised money, you know, time is on your side. When you yes. have, now you have runway. So I would advise any founder that is looking to raise money to first take, like stop, um, think about what they want out of their lifestyle and their business, what's best for their business, yes. and then make sure that they're ready to raise money before just jumping in two feet. Sure. That's great. Now, what's next? We've got some investors on the line who are always looking for the next uh, place to park their, write some checks. What is next for you guys? And, and you know, should anybody have you guys on their mind a year down the road, two years down the road? What, what are you thinking? Uh, our, our goal is too much. <laughs> yeah. No. Well, I mean, our goal this year is um, to reach profitability. I think we're at the stage of company and stage of business where we have, we're fortunate to have bagged uh, some really big clients that have been halos for us in the industry. We have really strong partners that have been able to accelerate the adoption of our service by financial institutions across the states. Um, we have you know, a really strong uh, platform offering that we're building on top of. And we believe that profitability is in our reach in the first half of this year. And we're gonna march towards that and, uh, and continue to grow from there. That's really exciting. Well, well, good luck with that. And I'd say, you know, from our team, Jason and crew have really enjoyed working with you and, have, you know, had the same sentiments. It's been a lot of fun from from our vantage point to see you guys grow and, and hopefully continue to do so and be a, a partner along the way. Um, any other questions from from the folks on the line? That was that was really great, Corey, and we're excited to work with you and, and excited about the growth and, and look forward to continuing the relationship. Thanks so much for joining us. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right. <laughs> Take care, Corey. Have a good one. Bye now. Bye, everybody. Thanks for joining.